Hi and welcome back to Love English. I'm Leila, and in today's lesson we are going to be looking at grammar but specifically we are going to be looking at the differences between British and American English grammar. Most of the time we focus on the differences in vocabulary and of course pronunciation but rarely do we actually examine what those differences are when it comes to grammatical structures. Now, there are seven big differences between British and American grammar. I'm going to be going through all of them and at the end of the lesson, I'll be telling you which I think is best for you to be using. And of course, when it comes to exams, should you be using British English or American English? Which one is right to use. Now before we get started, do I look like Beetlejuice? <laughs> Has anyone seen the Tim Burton film Beetlejuice? Well, I did when I was about 10 years old and it terrified me. I bought this shirt the other day online, so I didn't try it on before, and I kind of think it looks a bit like a Beetlejuice outfit. So maybe if you say my name three times, I'll appear. <laughs> right, let's get started on with the lesson looking at the grammatical differences between British and American English and my opinions on which one is best to use for exams and in general. Right, difference number one, the use of present perfect. If you don't already know what the present perfect tense is, it is simply have or has followed by the past participle. Now, this tense is used when we are referring to a time period, something that has happened up until recently. Somehow the action, the event is connected to now. This could be for a number of different reasons. You might use it to talk about a past experience. I have been to Australia, I have ridden a horse or you could use it because you are referring to a time period that has not finished. I've eaten a lot of chocolate today. So I'm not gonna get into the details of the present perfect, but what I want you to notice is that in American English, the present perfect is used a lot less frequently. They are more inclined to use the past simple. And of course, if you're American guys, do comment below and tell me if I'm on the right tracks here. I've done a lot of research but let's be honest, I've never been to America. I've watched a lot of films, a lot of television series, and I have noticed that the Americans tend to use the past simple more often than the present perfect. So let's look at some examples in the different ways the Americans and the Brits might use the present perfect, or not in this case. So when you see A, M, and a big E, that is American English, and when you see B, R, and a big E, that is British English. Hopefully that's not too confusing for you. I'm sure it's not. Sabra feels ill. She ate too much chocolate. Sabra feels ill. She's eaten too much chocolate. With sentences that contain already, yet, and just, just as we would commonly use them in present perfect when it comes to British English, they would also use them in American English, but with the past simple. Again, I'm generalizing. Of course, there could be many Americans that also use the present perfect tense, but as a general rule, this is one of the differences you will notice. Are they going to the cinema tonight? No, they already saw the new James Bond film. Are they going to the cinema tonight? No, they've already seen the new James Bond film. Is Ali here? No, he just left. Is Ali here? No, he's just left. He's just left. Can I borrow your book? No, I didn't read it yet. Can I borrow your book? No, I haven't read it yet. No, I haven't read it yet. So there we can see the differences in the structures that Americans and Brits would use. Pay attention next time you're watching a British television series, an American television series, and see if you can spot that grammar difference. I certainly will be having a look next time I'm on Netflix. Number two is the verb agreement that we have with collective nouns. So now whether you refer to a collective noun as an individual idea or unit or as many individuals will impact whether you use 
a plural verb or a singular verb. So is versus are. Family is a great example. Which one is correct? My family is coming tonight or my family are coming tonight? Which one sounds right to you? Now in American English, they would more commonly use the singular verb is, but in British English, you would also hear are. In fact, both sound acceptable to me. For me, I would probably use are. My family are coming over tonight. So it really depends on your preference, but certainly in American English, more common to hear is, my family is, versus British English where both are acceptable. Some more examples of where you would hear this difference with staff, government, class, team, and again, family. The team is winning. The team are winning. The government are making so many mistakes. The government is making so many mistakes. So remember, in British English, you can use either is or are. It really doesn't matter too much, but I think you're more likely to hear are. The government are making many mistakes. The staff are in a meeting. Simple, but hopefully it will clear up some confusion because certainly many of my students have asked me, is or are, which one is correct? Truthfully, both are acceptable, but more acceptable in the UK, whereas in America, you would be expected to use the singular verb. So that was difference number two. Okay, number three, and I think you guys already know this one, the lexical verbs. No, it's nothing too scary. It is simply the verb take and have. Basically, a delexical verb is a verb that on its own has very little meaning. Its meaning comes from the noun you put it with. For example, I can have a bath, but I can also have dinner. Now, I'm not eating my bath and I'm not swimming or bathing in my dinner. So there you can see that the verb have takes on the meaning to consume when we talk about dinner, to eat, but to bathe, to relax, to wash, when we're talking about a bath. So that is a delexical verb, a verb that takes its meaning from the noun that on its own has very little meaning. Now, as you've noticed, I use have with bath. I also use have with shower. I also use have with nap, a small sleep. I have a nap, I have a shower, I have a bath. But for those of you who have watched many American films or television series, you'll more commonly hear the verb take. I need to take a bath, take a shower, or even take a vacation. In British English, you would have a holiday. So there we've got an example of the grammar and vocabulary being quite different in British and American English. So hopefully that's a nice simple one to understand, but one you can pay attention to. Again, don't stress too much if you think you say take a shower. It might just be because you've watched a lot of American films or you've studied with an American teacher. People will understand what you mean in both countries. It is not gonna be a major problem. But comment below and let me know which would you more commonly use? Would you have a bath, have a shower, have a holiday? Or would you take a bath, take a shower, take a holiday, take a break, have a break? Which verb would you normally use? Comment below and let me know. Number four, and I think this is quite a big one. And again, it's one like, which verb do I use with family, is or are, that I often have students ask me about. Have or have got, have or have got. Now, in British English, you can use both, but you will commonly hear have got in more informal situations, whereas have would be in more formal or written formal communication. Simply referring to possessing something, I have got, or it could be referring to an obligation. I've got a cat, I have a cat. I've got to buy food for my cat. I have to buy food for my cat. So in American English, you are more likely to use or to hear have got. I have got a car. 
I have got to go to the shops. Here it is adding slightly more emphasis. It's strengthening the sentence, putting more importance on something. I have got a big house. I have a big house. It really doesn't have much difference in meaning, simply slightly more emphasis. And again, it just depends on whether you want to use British or American English. It doesn't really matter which you use, but you'll probably hear both, especially in the UK. I would say, I've got a cat. Remember to use that contraction, I've got, I've got, I've got a cat. I've got to buy food for the cat. I've got a cat. Don't forget that important contraction when you speak. And again, I'll just stress that in British English, if we're in a more formal situation, probably in a business meeting, maybe given a presentation at university or in a business situation, then you're more likely to remove that got because it is quite a colloquial verb, get, got, another dilexical verb in fact, and we'd simply stick with have. So again, pay attention next time you're watching a British and then an American television series. Compare the two grammatical structures. Do you hear and do you notice that Americans use have got more than the Brits? Let me know. Okay, number five, and again, one that I wasn't really sure about until I did the research. The use of auxiliary and modal verbs. Now, what is an auxiliary verb? Well, an auxiliary verb is the verb that comes before the main verb. You don't always have an auxiliary verb in a sentence. For example, I eat chocolate. The main verb is eat, there's no auxiliary. I'm eating chocolate. The verb to be, I am, is the auxiliary verb. In the same way, in a negative sentence, she didn't eat the chocolate, didn't is the auxiliary verb. Hopefully we've got that now. Now in British English, the auxiliary verb is often used in substitute of the main verb when we are giving an answer. So, as an example, are you coming with us? I might do, I might do, but in American English, I might, I might. And when it comes to modal verbs, there are some that the Brits will use that the Americans don't. As an example, needn't, needn't, need not. Basically, you don't have to, a lack of obligation. You needn't come to the meeting today. It's not going to be very important. Americans are more likely to say you haven't got to or you don't need to. So in British English, we use the modal needn't, needn't, need not. And in British English, shall is sometimes used as a substitute of will when we are referring to the future. I shall be there, I will be there, I'll be there, I shall be there. Shall in British English is more formal. You'll hear it in more formal kind of uh, proper situations. So again, you're gonna hear both. You're gonna hear I'll, but you might also hear shall. Definitely in American English, you're more likely to hear will, and very rarely, if at all, will you hear shall. If you have, let me know. Or if you're American and you use shall to talk about the future, great, tell me. This is just my research. Again, I haven't spoken to every American in the USA. In addition to using shall to talk about the future, we will also use this when talking about giving advice, getting advice from someone or an opinion in the same way that we could use should. Should I go out tonight? Or shall I go out tonight? Shall I ask for his number? What shall I do? So in this way, we are looking at asking for advice and opinions. Americans are more likely to just stick with should. Should I do this? Should I do that? Whereas Brits would use both interchangeably doesn't really matter which you use in the UK. But again, shall does sound a little bit more formal. So it depends on the situation. Number six, prepositions. Yes, those little words that make a big difference. The first one that I think most people are aware of is write. She wrote to me. Or in American English, she wrote me. She wrote me. Now I don't know why, but it really does irritate me in American English to omit the two, to not use two. It's a silly thing, 
I don't know why, it's a pet peeve, it's something that irritates me, a bit like nails on a chalkboard, but write me just feels wrong. But it's not, it's just American English. English has many varieties, so bad teacher, it's not wrong, it's just different. I promised to write to her every day. I promised to write her every day. Now, another preposition that in British English we commonly use when we are referring to time is at. At. So in British English we would say at the weekend, but in American English you might hear more often on, on the weekend. Yes, in American English on is always used with the weekend, whereas in British at is more common but you might hear on the weekend because again we've been influenced a lot by the American language. I was busy on the weekend, I was busy more commonly at the weekend. Just remember the influence that the American language has had on the British language. Brits have had less influence on America really because of media and things like this. When it comes to talking about university or school, she studied mathematics at university, she studied science at school, but in American English more commonly she studied mathematics in university or she studied science in school. So in and at. When we're talking about universities or institutions, she's in the hospital, she's at the hospital. A small difference but one you might notice now when you're watching TV. And with the adjective different. Different. You will hear a difference with the prepositions used with different. In British English this place is different to anything I've seen before. This place is different from anything I've seen before. So it's the difference between than and to. Than in American English but to in British English. Small differences, doesn't really make too much difference which you use but at least you know why there's a difference now. And finally, this is one that we should all be aware of and one that I would say has changed the British English language a lot because I would suggest that a lot of people now actually use the American form of this verb. It is the past participle. So if we take a verb like dream, dream is the infinitive, dreamed would be the past participle and the past simple, dreamed dreamed, dreamed, but in British English, dream, dreamt, dreamt. I dreamt about you last night. I dreamed about you last night. I dreamed about you last night. And the biggest difference, get, got, gotten. Do you think this is British or American English? British or American English, got, gotten. It's American. So in American English, you might hear this sentence. I've gotten wet. It's raining outside and I've gotten wet. But in British English you're more likely to hear I've got wet. This is the present perfect tense. We're not using have got as a modal verb referring to possession or an obligation. This is a sentence talking about something that has happened to you. This is a tense. So I've gotten wet or I've got wet. British and American English. Some other past participles that are different in British and American English. Burn, burned, burned, but burn, burnt, burnt. You can see the pattern emerging here. Learn, learned, learned, learn, learnt, learnt. Smell, smelled, smelled, smell, smelt, smelt. Spell, spelled, spelled, spell, spelt, spelt. Spill, Spill, spilled, spilled, spilt, spill, spilt. Oh my goodness, you get the idea, guys. There are lots of verbs that if you see the T at the end instead of the ED, you can guess that that person is British. But if you see the ED, more likely American. However, again, that influence coming over, sometimes you will see ED in British English. That really is a case of written English more than pronunciation because often with the t and d you won't hear a big difference. I smelled lovely, I smelt lovely. Bit different but not much. 
Which brings us to the end of the lesson and my opinion on which is better. Now, I think I've covered it already, really. There's no such thing as better. There is just such a thing as different. And when it comes to exam English, really the main thing is to be consistent. If you use British English, whether that's vocabulary, grammar, spelling, stick to British. If you use American, stick to American, guys. As long as you are consistent, there is no difference. So thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you more with grammar, vocabulary and idioms very soon.